Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, where did you get to know me? And Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The Gospel of the Lord. Distance does not separate us. Silence does. These words were spoken by a man to which there is no deceit. It's also a true saying, wouldn't you agree, for anyone who may have ever experienced the silent treatment. Oh, what a terrible feeling it is not to know the mind and the thoughts of the one who you love. What did I say? What do they do? What do I not do? What should I have said? Your mind begins to race in all these different places, and there's one thing that comes between you and the other person, and it's not distance. It's silence. There is no deceit in that proverb. Today, I have the great pleasure of presenting to you the story of Samuel, the story of Nathaniel, and your story. And I will not remain silent because I would dare not have anything that separates you from the love of Christ. Let's talk a little bit about Samuel, shall we? Samuel is a great character in the Bible. We know that there is a book or two named after him. And Samuel, well, he had a lot of roles in life, let's just say. And the great pleasure that we have with some of these stories in the Bible is that we actually get to see people grow up in their faith in God. Samuel is one of those examples. The story that we've heard today is about someone who, in a silent place, hears God's voice. Not once, but twice. Now, there are six people in the Bible, three in the Old Testament and three in the New Testament, to where their names are repeated twice. I'll see if I can remember them. Abraham, Moses, Jacob, and Samuel, that's the four. There might be seven of them. Bear with me. There is Martha. There is Saul, who later on changed his name to Paul. And there is Nathaniel. How many was that? Seven? Seven people in the Bible have the great honor of having their name called twice by Jehovah, by God Almighty, from above, speaking through the heavens. Out of the silence, their name is spoken. Samuel is a young boy. He's 11 years of age. He is an apprentice and understudy of one of those who was a priest whose responsibility was to look after the Ark of the Covenant. And inside the Ark, if you were to open it, you would probably be killed on the spot, as they say. But underneath the hood of the Ark, you would find perhaps some of the bones of Elijah and those wonderful stone tablets that Moses brought down from Sinai. The ark traveled around. Remember, Israel, the nation, had not formed yet in the days of little Samuel. It was kind of a nomadic movement of the ark from place to place. And it happened to fall on this particular time of the month, I guess, that the prophet, no, priest, Eli, 
who was the responsible person to look after the, the ark, uh, the, the tribe of Ephraim, I believe, he was supposed to keep watch. That's what priests did. They kept watch. They kept watch over the table and everything else that reminded them of who God is, what was holy. Eli was supposed to keep the ark preserved by lock and key in the form of, are you ready for this? A lit candle. How do you know God is there? That candle will be lit. That's it. If the candle is lit, everything's fine. Now, they didn't have controllable airspace like we do. They were out there, so to speak. And although it was a room, I'm sure the wind howled. I'm sure things happened. Can you imagine the anxiety on the priests every time the wind blew? Oh my goodness. What if the light gets blown out? What will I ever do? The light represented the presence of God. And I will make one little illustration here today because I think it's always neat and helpful and beneficial to tie together those symbols in the church presently. Did you know there's one light inside the church that is never to go out and ultra guilds don't say a word? They know where it is already. Can someone just point in the direction of where that light may be found in this church? Over there in the chapel. And inside the chapel is the Holy of Holies. It's a tabernacle carved and hewn into the wall with a beautiful fashioned gold plate that has a key. And to the left of it is what? A candle. Now, I'm here to tell you, we aim to always keep the candle lit. The light represents something. It reminds us of the sacredness of God being in our presence at all times. Heaven forbid we're ever separated from God because our light goes out. All right, I know your mind's already thinking of all these different ways to analogize with that light. Let me bring you back to the story real quick. Samuel is the understudy to Eli. He is 11 years of age. He has not become a man yet. The rite of passage is that he has to study underneath somebody to teach him. Eli was his teacher. Eli was a priest. And Eli, although the light was lit, there was nobody home. <laughs> the silent treatment was being extended because somebody let the light inside go out. Eli and his son it says it in Scripture, turn their backs on God and blaspheme God. And how does that happen exactly? Blasphemy means that you attribute something of maybe what is evil to who God is. That's why when someone says those words that I would dare never repeat or say myself, but if you say those words, you are taking something that's sacred and you're making it something dead. God forbid we let our lights go out and that we become separated. There will be silence. Silence was in the midst of the people, of the Jews traveling around. They carried that ark. But it says that God had done no good deed with his people for a long time. Because his people were separated not by distance, but by silence, forgetting who they were, who led them out of bondage, and who was taking care of them, who was actually with them, but they refused to acknowledge. Brothers and sisters, never give God the silent treatment. It is in the silence in which God speaks. And there's little Samuel, 11 years of age, and before Eli goes to bed, he says, Samuel, whatever you do, do not let the light go out. Imagine what went through his mind. He's there reading the sacred text, which he was supposed to do. The light is shining. And all of a sudden, it flickers. And something tingles his ears. And he hears a voice. Samuel. Yes, yes, Lord, I'm coming. And he runs back to Eli, thinking that Eli was calling his name. And Eli is disturbed from his sleep and says, what in the world do you want at this hour? You, you called me. No, I didn't. Now, let me go back to bed. Go watch the light. So Samuel goes back into the room. He starts reading scripture. Light flickers a little bit. 
His ears tingle. Samuel. Oh. He goes. He wakes up his master, Eli. And Eli says, what is it now? He called my name. I didn't call your name. It was silent, and I heard my name called, and it's just me and you. At that moment, we now see Eli with a light bulb on his own head going, it was God who called you. Now, there was some other exchange of information. God told Samuel that Eli's house was going to be punished. This is the church, so to speak, in that area, the tribe of Ephraim, where the ark was located. And now Eli begs Samuel, don't hold back a word. Don't give me the silent treatment of what God told you. Okay, I'm not going to like what I'm going to tell you. And he tells him, because you and your son have blasphemed God, have turned your back, have not acknowledged him in all your ways, have lumped him in to all the idols around in the culture around us, you've diminished the power of God, and when you did that, God says, I'm going to punish your house. I'm going to leave. The light went out. We don't want the light ever to go out. How do we not let the light go out? Well, we follow Samuel along the way. And I'm going to fast forward because we don't have enough time to go into the story. But it's a great story. From the age of 11, he graduates up. He himself becomes a judge. And he is the last of the judges in the Old Testament. And he transitions from the judges to the kings, and he is going to anoint as the priest and the judge Saul. Not to be confused with Saul in the New Testament, but Saul in the Old Testament. Saul, called by God, by the way, he was narcissistic, he was uh, impure, so many flaws in Saul. But Saul got Israel battle ready to do what God apparently needed them to do. Saul was the first king, and then as the story goes, there's going to be a successor, and Samuel, older, calls the father Jesse, who has many sons, and the one who's not there, the youngest, who's a shepherd boy, whose name is David, is then ordained as the next king. Whew! I told you it was a great story. And we can learn a lot from this story. I find it interesting, too, that Samuel, when he got to that point, of looking for David, there were many brothers, there were many sons. It's the one that's the least and the less. The one who probably spent a lot of time out there herding those sheep, listening to God in the wind and the silence, hearing God's voice. He was the one summoned to be the king of Israel. And Samuel laid his hands on him. Samuel became a prophet. Samuel is a miracle baby. We know that he wasn't even supposed to be born. His mother Hannah was barren, and yet God blessed her. There's so many things I can tell you about him. And Samuel, just by the translation of his name, means God heard. Josephus, the Jewish historian, writes about how his name is profound in all of the sacred texts of Judaism because he listened to God. You know the hardest part about listening? We don't know when to stop talking. I've always said that. We were designed with two ears and one mouth. A lot of times we don't listen to God. We don't listen to each other because we're too consumed with our own thoughts and practices and we don't give the other person a chance. I think that's the reason why we let the light go out in our world today. Now I'm going to bring you into the account of Nathaniel. Nathaniel, as much as I want to say is the New Testament equivalent to, to Samuel, I want to say that they're just exactly alike. Why else would there be a parallel between these two accounts of one being spoken to in silence? Nathaniel's name was also referred to twice in the, in the New Testament. Nathaniel is not 11 years of age. He's a little bit older. He's a friend of Andrew and Philip, and Andrew and Philip were recently converted to being disciples of Jesus. And they want to bring him to meet the one, the Messiah. Well, they probably didn't think Messiah. They just thought he was a really cool teacher with long hair and wore sandals and traveled around the desert. But they said, he's the one that Moses was talking about, and we believe he's the prophet of the Most High. There's a lot of good things happening here. We want you to come and see who we're talking about. And, of course, Nathaniel, you would think, would just jump right on that thing and say, show me the way. 
Tell me where this man Jesus is. But instead, he says, I want to first see his resume. Where was he born or where is he from? Well, he's, uh, hmm, he's from Nazareth. Nazareth? What good could come out of Nazareth? All right? I mean, I don't want to list a city out there as an equivalent, but I'm sure you might be thinking, what good could come out of any city out there? How can Jesus and his light be in that place? Nazareth was not known as a place where something good would come out of. And that's why Nathaniel said, what good can come out of Nazareth? Everything should have come out of Jerusalem. Bethlehem was a good second. But Nazareth? Come on. So then they bring him, and the picture that I put on the customary today is one by the French artist uh, Tissot, one of my favorites, and, or Tissot. And in that piece of art, it shows these people kind of sitting around Jesus. And in the backdrop, you can see some movement, and it's, it's a detail of when Nathaniel was called in a particular crisis in his life. As he's coming, I can only speculate that Jesus says, aha, here comes a man of Israel to which there is no guile, there is no deceit. Now, there's a lot of tongue in cheek, I think, that goes in here. Because why would that be announced in such a way? Remember, Nathaniel doubted Jesus had anything good because of him being from Nazareth. Could this be Jesus' way of just saying, hey, here's a man of God from Israel to which there's no deceit. Now, that got Nathaniel's attention. And Nathaniel got closer and closer and said, how do you know me? And Jesus said, I saw you under the fig tree. Now, theologians have struggled left and right about what the thorn in the flesh was of St. Paul. Likewise, we don't know exactly what was encountered under that fig tree. But I do find it very interesting that it was something, most likely, that Nathaniel did not want to be seen or revealed by the light. Perhaps something he was ashamed of. And only God could possibly know what was there. Now you can put the purity, the earnestness of an open slate of Samuel at the age of 11, listening to God's voice. And now you can go over here and hear Nathaniel, older, been around the block, also hearing God's voice. Most compelling that the architects of the lectionary slid in that epistle talking about sexual immorality. Talking about how fornication is something that blasphemes God. We don't know what was going on in that scene of fig tree, but Nathaniel, within a minute, second, knew, for example, that Jesus was the Son of God because only God could have known. Those are two stories. Now let's talk about your story. Where are you when you listen to God? Do you feel separated? It's probably not distance. It's silence. Silence goes both ways. It's basically we not calling out and asking God to be in our hearts, or God's calling upon us, and we just don't want to listen. So which is it for you? Are you not bringing him closer to you today, or are you pushing him away? might be in that happy medium somewhere. I don't know. I'm not making any judgments here. But we've got this wonderful story that is being revealed today, which is the human story. It's the constant story that's been around forever. And for the life of us, we don't understand why the light goes out for some people. But if we could tell them about Jesus Christ and about how he is with us every step of the way, he sees everything, he hears everything, even what's in our thoughts, then maybe there won't be so much distance in the world. Maybe it will bring us comfort to know that the Counselor is with us at all times, illuminating our path and helping us find peace in the midst of fear, joy in the midst of sorrow. We need to be a light in the world. We need to 
invite people to a closer connection with Christ. Invite them to church. Invite them to receive the sacrament and be immersed in God's word and let them listen as the wood and the stone, the fabric, the silence. Hold God. God wants to hold us. And remind those who are really downtrodden that distance does not separate them from God, but silence.